This problem began, as they usually do, when it was noticed there was no picture on the air and the engineer was called to fix the problem. Upon arrival, it was found that the transmitter was in collector cooling mode, which is a safe mode the transmitter goes to when it's been off for a period of time. The transmitter had shut down in order to protect itself. After several trips within a certain amount of time, the transmitter shuts down. The first step in troubleshooting is to check the history of the transmitter. But while this is happening, you can allow the transmitter to warm itself back up. So the first step here is to reset the faults and allow the transmitter to go into start mode, which will warm up the tube. As the tube warms up and the transmitter becomes ready, the history can be checked. Going about it this way allows the engineer to get the transmitter back on the air in the shortest amount of time possible. In this transmitter, a record is kept of every mode change of the transmitter, be it manually or automatically activated. By progressively stepping back through the history records, the first event that started the problem can be found. And here's the original problem a primary fault on the exciter output relay for the RF drive. Unknown to the transmitter engineer, this is where the second problem of the evening starts. Just because the display says RF relay does not necessarily mean that is the problem. Stepping through the history display you can see where the transmitter had tried to restart itself three times, but each time it was taken off the air due to the fault. This is normal in transmitters and is called the auto restart function. Here you can see the auto restart in action. When the first fault occurs, the number one light comes on. Now the transmitter attempts to restart itself, but when the same fault is encountered, the second fault light comes on. The transmitter has tried to restart itself again, but encounters a fault again, and therefore all three attempts have failed. Now the system disables the auto restart function. So the fault seems to lie with the RF switch, which is used to kill the RF drive going to the IPA and then on to the IoT. Here is the switch itself, mounted at the back of the transmitter next to the IPA amplifiers. This screen shows there is less than five minutes to wait before the transmitter is ready to have beam applied to it. Now the transmitter is in the start mode and is ready to have high voltage applied to it. From this display, you can also see how many hours the tube has been in operation and how many crowbars have been fired. As with most IOTs, after the high voltage has been removed for some period of time, they don't like to be turned back on. This one is no different. When high voltage is applied, the transmitter faults with an ion pump current, which is fairly normal. Each time you see the screen flash, that was another attempt to bring high voltage up. But after a couple of attempts, high voltage is maintained. Now the transmitter is in B mode, which means high voltage has been applied to the tube and it is drawing current. The next step would be to apply RF to the tube and make power. Here, the problem can be seen. When attempting to go to the RF mode, 
the HPA ready light starts flashing red, indicating it is not ready and there is a fault. This brings us back to the RF relay, which we'll now remove in order to test it. The relay is mounted next to the IPA amplifiers and is held in place with two screws, which must be removed first. Once removed, the relay is disassembled for inspection. Now the coil of the relay and the reed switch attached to it can be seen. Using a bench power supply, the relay can be tested to see that it functions correctly. With voltage applied to the relay, it can be seen that it does work. Here in this close-up, you can see the armature moving back and forth. After putting the relay back together, there is one more test that can be performed before mounting it back in the transmitter. Testing the tally contacts of the switch is also important. And as you can see here, the read switch is working and shorting out the contacts whenever power is applied to the switch. Now the RF switch can be remounted into the transmitter and tested as a complete system. Now the RF connections can be made. First, the input to the IPA amplifiers is attached. Next is the RF output from the exciter. The top connection is a terminator, which is used as a load whenever the RF is not supplied to the IPAs. After it's been reinstalled, the transmitter is tested once again. Unfortunately, the same fault occurs. But after all these simple things have been tested, namely the switch, something else catches the engineer's eye. These lights are all out. This is what indicates that the IPAs are functioning, but without the lights on, it shows they are not, which leads the engineer to the power supply that feeds the IPAs. The IPA power supply is fed from a circuit breaker, and the first step is to check that. But it is found to be in the on position and not tripped. Checking the power supply itself, it is found that it is supplied with the 208 three-phase power. Therefore, the power supply itself is at fault and needs to be changed. Once a new power supply has been obtained, it's a simple matter to install it. Now, the indicator lights are all on, showing that the power supply is working along with all the IPAs. And RF drive mode is achieved at full power. Although the transmitter engineer was able to repair the problem, he was misled by the technology meant to help him. Back in the day of idiot lights on the front of transmitters, this never would have happened. But today, if you put too much trust in the technology, you can be misled.